One has to understand what action is, and likewise, one has to understand what is wrong action, and one has to understand about inaction. Hard to understand is the way of work. Shri Krishna has talked about three things in this verse. Karma, in the first line, action. Then you got Vikarma, in the sec last word of the second line, wrong action. And Akarmana, which means inaction. Action, wrong action, and inaction. He says that we have to understand all three of these because it's hard to understand the way of work. This is very true. We have to understand this through various commentaries on the Gita because there's lots of interpretations as to what that word Vikarma in the second line means. Some people don't, don't interpret it as wrong action, they interpret it as the mental state you should have when you perform actions, in that you should pour your heart fully into actions. So let's understand this through various commentaries on the Gita. First of all, we have to understand what action is. Action is what you do combined with your dharma, your means, and your circumstances. Your dharma, your means, and your circumstances. Many commentators say that when you do something with a the resolve, then it is action. When you resolve something in your mind, then do something that is action. If you decide that you want to go somewhere for vacation during Christmas, if all the preparations you make, for example, what to take, where to stay, how to get there, how much to spend, are all within the boundaries of your dharma and your circumstances, then it is an action. When you do this, then your file of your Christmas vacation is open and you put everything in that file. This is action. When a child gets born, his mother opens the file for his wedding or her wedding. She decides when she or he will get married, how they will get married, what type of girl or boy they will get married to. The mother looks at the daughter or son and starts thinking about their wedding even though they are two years old. This file is open. The actions start increasing and the consequences of the action happen. The, the imprints get together in the mind. This is action. Many scriptures say that things done for the development of oneself, the family and society are actions. Then you've got inaction. Two types of uh, action, uh, inaction are given by commentators. Some commentators say that not doing any action is inaction. But many commentators disagree with this because Shri Krishna said, what did Shri Krishna say in the second, third chapter at the beginning? Remember? He said that even the body cannot be maintained without action. So you have to perform actions. Therefore, these people say that inaction entails actions done without desire. Therefore, actions, as Sri Krishna said two verses ago, that will not lead to bondages uh, are inaction. You have to do actions. Actions done without desire do not create bondages. These are actions from which you do not want anything and which you've got no investment in the future. Inaction also entails actions needed to preserve one's existence. When you wake up, then you need to have a shower, eat, breathe and so on. And we not, don't have a motive behind any of this because we have to perform these actions to preserve the existence. Commentators say that even animals and insects perform inactions. Meaning eating, sleeping, the instinct of fear, and uh, breeding are all qualities of humans as well as animals. But if we perform these actions, then it is a misuse of human life. I repeat it. Eating, sleeping, the instinct of fear, and breeding are all qualities of humans as well as animals. But if you perform these actions, then it is a misuse of human life. We may do these things, but they are not final. We are not for them. You eat, but you are not born for eating. That's inaction. You must understand wrong action as well. There are two opposite types of wrong actions according to the scriptures. The first are actions beyond one's limit and that one should not do. In ancient times, these were called wrong actions and even modern commentators such as Gandhi call them wrong actions. Our scriptures have told us not to perform these actions that are beyond our limits. An example of a wrong action is violence. Robbery is another as is murder. Our scriptures say no to these things. If a person does these things, then they are wrong actions. Also, things that are the opposite of what we defined earlier as actions 
are wrong actions. They include things from which a person doesn't develop himself and from which society doesn't develop. Many scriptures, this is the second interpretation of, uh, it, the word is vikarma, so you had wrong actions. Many people, scriptures give the complete opposite definition and say vikarma means special actions or vishesh karma, which are actions in which you pour your entire heart into them. Completely opposite definition, vikarma. The specific, the special thing about them is that they are done with the mind and the heart. They are not done because one has to do them or to preserve existence. They're done heartily with one's heart. If you know what Bhava he's written one of the best English commentaries or translations of the Gita. Uh, he was a freedom fighter with Gandhi, a uh, life celibate, and he, he was one of the first Satyagrahi in uh, Gandhi's um, freedom movement. He gave us a very good, such a beautiful commentary of the Gita. He's giving a very good formula of what action, inaction, and wrong uh, vikarma are. The akarma, akarma, and vikarma. He says that if you pour vikarma into actions, vikarma is the mental state of putting your heart into actions, into actions, which you're doing things for a goal or for a good purpose, then they become inactions. If you pour vikarma into karma actions, then they become akarma, inactions. For Vinobhavare, vikarma are sp these special actions done with one's heart. Gandhiji ref defines wrong actions, uh, vikarma as actions beyond limits, but Vinobhavare defines vikarma as these special actions. Therefore, when you pour vikarma into karma actions, and therefore perform actions with your heart, then they become inactions. Because then, you will have bliss in action, and therefore, there will be no greed for the fruits of actions left. Therefore, actions plus, okay, karma, actions, plus vikarma, special actions done with the heart, equals akarma, in actions. Everyone understood? Vinoba Baba said this very nicely. A, an example to demonstrate. Nanda Bhai Bhatt, who was a social reformer in India, because when the British left India, the entire rural education system was underdeveloped. He went around and revolutionized the entire rural education system. He gives a very good example to demonstrate this. There's a clothes dyer and he was applying colored dye on some dresses. A big businessman in a town passed by and he saw that he had made a dress of very nice colors. The big businessman saw the finished product and really liked it. He told him that he wanted that dress. The dyer apologized and said that he had made that dress for his wife and so he could not do it for him. The biggest businessman said that he also wanted to get a dress like that for his wife. The dyer said, no, he couldn't get that same one. The big businessman asked if the dyer could make a dress with similar colors, designs, and textures for his wife. The dyer said, fine, I'll agree to, I'll try to make it similar. The dress was made and a big businessman came to pick it up. He observed it and saw that it was nice, but it was not as good as the one that the dyer had made. He asked, he said that the colors are not as good as they were in that dress. The dyer said that of course they'll be different because the colors in the first dress were the colors of his heart. He had made this first dress for the person he loved, his wife. The colors were the same in both, but the feeling one gets when he does something for his wife does not come when he makes it for someone else's wife. Therefore, you should perform actions with all your heart, with your heart. When Vikarma, Special actions are poured into karma actions, then they become inactions, a karma. If you perform actions fluently, then they become actions. How can you perform work fluently? First of all, when a perform work, person performs work, then what does he think in the mind? What does he think? Work done with the ego in mind leads one towards wrong actions. All actions are done with egotism, with the attitude that I am doing. When the ego goes away from work, from karma, then it becomes akarma, inaction. You should not have the attitude that you are performing work. Instead, think that God is making you do it. And God is not a person in a white beard. God is a person in your heart. He's making you do it. Think that you're doing it through the strengths that God has given you. Then it becomes inaction. Now, broadly speaking, two types of people in society. The first is materialistic people, and second is the people that have renounced materiality in their mind. A person that
that has given everything all of these up in his mind can still be materialistic in his mind and a person who is materialistic on the outside can still have renounced everything in his mind. Remember that. A person that has given up everything in the outside world can still be materialistic in his mind and a person who is materialistic on the outside can still renounce everything in his mind. A sannyasi, who knows what a sannyasi is? A person who has renounced everything is not someone on the outside or an external show with orange clothes and a beard. It is an attitude. In the last chapter, 18th chapter of the Gita, Shri Krishna gives a definition of this. Kamyayam karma sadam samyasi kava yohitu Meaning that when all the desires and wishes in the mind, not on the outside, in the mind are gone, then everything that a person does is an action of a sannyasi. Because a person can be a sannyasi from the outside, but he can still not be a sannyasi on the inside. Such a person is not a sannyasi. Story to demonstrate. In King Bhoj's uh, kingdom, there was a saint. Who's heard of the saint Kalidas? Very famous saint in India, Kalidas. He had the position of chief priest. All the priests of the palace wanted that position of chief priest. When Kalidas was there, then they would not be able to get that position. They made a lot of efforts, but they could not compete with him intellectually. They could not compete with him, and therefore they tried to put him down. This was their nature. All the other priests got together and they made a plan. They knew that they could not compete with him intellectually, so they needed another way. In the morning, when Kalidas was sitting on a swing outside his house reading a newspaper, then all these priests were watching him. There were about 15 to 20 priests and they walked towards him. Kalidas saw all these priests coming towards him and he thought that when all these intellectuals had got together, there must be something dangerous. Otherwise, why would all of these intellectuals have gotten together? Kalidas thought that he would not have to worry and he would let them come. They came to a house and he let them sat, sit down. He said that he considered himself very lucky that all these knowledgeable people had come to see him. He gave them all water, tea and the rest. Kalidas asked what he could do to serve them. They all started putting their plan in action and one of the priests told him that they had stayed in the palace for a long time and the king respects knowledgeable people or not. They said that they've enjoyed a lot of respect, but now it has become too much. They said that they decided this, uh, they should all now renounce everything and give up the material world. They said that they decided this and wanted to take Kalidas with them because he was one of them. Kalidas replied that this was a good plan of theirs, it was a good idea, and asked them where they planned to take it. The priest said that they would go to the holy city of Kashi, and meet a well-known sannyasi. Kalidas agreed to do it with them. He said that if they said so, then there's no way he could object to it. They all left and reached Kashi. There was a sannyasi there who was ready to give them initiations. They told him that they were priests of King Borja's kingdom and they had decided to become sannyasis, men of renunciation. He asked, them to they asked him to give him sannyas, renunciation. The great saint agreed to do this and asked them to come one by one. The priest said that Kalidas would go first. The plan was that Kalidas would go first and become a sannyasi, and they would go back without him, so that once he becomes a sannyasi, he would not be able to come back to the palace. The priest said that Kalidas was their leader, and the most important out of all of them, and therefore suggested that Kalidas should go first. But remember, this was Kalidas, not an ordinary person. Kalidas told them that he was a chief priest in the material world, but this is a sannyasi world, and that he may be a leader in the material world, but this is the, in this work, they were before him because they gave him the inspiration for this. He therefore told them that they should go first, then he would go. If Kalidas said this, then they could not do anything about it and began looking at themselves. They had no choice, but they had to do it. One after another, the priests took their initiations. The Guru doing the initiation always asks a question and if he thinks that the person has still not lost their interest in the material world, then he does not initiate them. Only when a person has fully renounced the material world and reached that stage of Vitaraga Bhaya Kroda. Who remembers that from last class? Vitaraga Bhaya Kroda. What is it? Free from passion, fear and anger. As so, uh, as so earlier, only then can that person become a sannyas. 
The Guru asked each of the priests what their wishes were. One of the priests said that he wants to go to the Saraya River and think about Sri Ram in Ayodhya and become one with Sri Ram for the remaining years of his life. The Guru gave him the initiation and named him Ramanand. When a person gets an initiation as a Samyasi, then the name changes. The Guru asked the second priest what his wish was and he said that he wanted to go to the Yamuna River and sing songs of Sri Krishna. The Guru gave him the initiation. What did he name him? Krishnanand. The third priest said that he wanted to go to Kailash and become one with Shivaji. The priest was made a sannyasi. What was his name? Shivanand. One by one, the priest got the initiation. Then Kalidas's turn came. The Guru asked him what his wish was. Kalidas told the Guru that he could not lie to him so he had a wish for the half cup of tea he had left unfinished at home. <laughs> he said that he still has interest in the material world and he remembers his wife and children. The great saint told him to go as he could not become a sannyasi. Kalidas agreed because without the Guru's consent he could not get the initiation. He therefore went back. What I mean to say that actions can only become inactions when they go away from the mind. We leave a lot, of, everyone gives up actions on the outside but they still stay in the minds. The attractions and the desires in our minds do not reduce. They must go. Only then do they become inactions. The action will be then be performed with fluency. Therefore, the first thing, we must get rid of this egotism. Second thing that ruins the fluency of actions, first thing was egotism, is artificiality. Artificiality becomes, comes as a result of one thing, the presence of other people. The other person becomes such a big part of our actions that we don't even know how much that they're directing our actions. When a housewife or a house husband is alone, for example at midday, then he may sit down on the sofa, put his feet up and read a newspaper, but as soon as the doorbell rings, then they do, does she or he does their clothes properly because someone else has come. Why has this happened? Because the other came. When she or he was alone, and she or he was to his, his or herself, she had the fluency, she was natural. When the other person came, then she wore a plastic smile. This happened as soon as the other person came. The smile is not actually hers, but it was put on her by the other. Our whole lives are directed by other people. That is why actions cannot become fluent and cannot become inactions. We do not perform these actions with our heart, but we perform them for other people. The other person becomes important from the smallest of things. When the husband or wife goes to the office at 9 a.m., then he tells his housewife or house husband to be ready uh, by 7 a.m., uh, 7 p.m., because they have to go to a wedding reception at that time. The wife or the husband at home says that's fine. Let us say in this example, the wife begins to get ready from 6 p.m., wears a favorite salary, the husband comes at 7 p.m. and asks her why she's still not ready. She says that she is ready, and the husband doesn't agree with the sari she's wearing. The wife said that she had decided she wanted to wear this sari. The husband says, do you know whose wedding we're going to? Do you know what type of people will go there? Change it. He told her not to wear the sari she liked, but the one that other people would like. She, her likes and dislikes were not important to him. What other people would say was the most important for him. The other person becomes so important. A person gets angry and you ask him why he's behaving that. He says that because of what someone else said to him. This means that the button to turn you all red is in someone else's hands. The other person presses a button and he turns red. A person praises us and we become happy. A person criticizes us and we become sad. The other person becomes so important and this means that we have become such machines that the remote control has been given to the other people in the world. If there is one TV in the house and five people are seated down to watch it and all five of them have a remote control, then what would happen to that TV? Would you be able to see anything on that TV? The father wants to see the news, the mother wishes to watch a daytime program, the son wishes, wants to watch an action film, the daughter wants to watch soap operas, the infant wants to watch cartoons. All these people want to watch something different. One scene doesn't even come because they're already switching channels. They all sit in front of the TV for one hour and do not watch anything. This is what happens to our minds. 
We are TV screens for which there are so many remote controls. However, this time all the people in the world hold a remote control for us, not just five. They all think about what the other person will feel. The consequence of this is that the person forgets, for, forgets about the action and the action that he's doing. He does not think about whether he will have any personal spiritual development. He doesn't think about what will God will think. He forgets this. I'm not telling you to be completely withdrawn. Please do not think that. What our scriptures teach us is that you should not give the power to others. Instead, we should give that power to ourselves. Think about what your God will think of it. Will your God like what you're doing? If he will, then your action will become an inaction. If you try to look at it from another way, then psychologists say that the majority of things that we call actions are not done out of freedom, but it is generally a reaction. We do not really act, we usually react. What we call actions are not reality actions, they are reactions. The person should not be reactive, they should be responsive. Al Guruji likes two words in English, react and respond. The majority of people perform only reactions. If someone praises us, then we're happy. Reacted, we reacted and we think about how we, we've done a good deed. No, you reacted. Be careful that in reactions, you always are a slave because a person performing the uh, response is the owner and a person reacting is always the slave. If someone criticizes us, then we're sad. We got sad because we reacted. The person in front of us performed the action. Have we therefore performed the action? No, we let the other person do it for us. You can only perform an action, the special action, when you become your own boss. You have to take charge of your actions. The majority of people are unable to do this. I gave a, an individual example, but the actions that we do are in fact reactions. There's also another example involved in influencing our reaction. Our acts are chains. The momentum, momentum behind actions is intensity. Are you performing your actions with intensity? I'll give you another example. It's a question example. Imagine you're coming back home late at 11 p.m. and you're sitting on the bench of Barbican Station, a railroad platform inside a city station, Barbican Station. The frequency of the trains has decreased and the trains only come every 15 minutes. You're waiting and you see a person coming in a distance. Your attention falls on him because there's hardly any people on the platform. The person is walking like a madman. His eyes are red and his hairs are all messy. This person comes and stands next to you. You notice him, but he does not notice you. You see a lot of these people in London. You see the train coming uh, because the horn comes and a light comes. You get up from your bench to catch the train. As soon as the train comes close, and the person next to you tries to jump onto the platform to be squashed under the train. You see that he's about to jump and you therefore grab hold of his hand. He tries to pull his hand back and tells you he wants to jump and go underneath the train. You tighten your grip of your hand and you don't let him fall onto the platform. The train goes and you miss the train. You make him sit down and ask him why he's trying to kill himself. You tell him that God has given him such a nice body and why is he throwing him this, away this body. After five to ten minutes you tell him nice things and you give him a water to drink uh, you go to Barbican News Agent, gave him a water drink. He realizes that his suicidal thoughts were a spare moment thing, and he calms down and brings himself back to normal. He thanks you for saving his life, and he says that he's very grateful to you. He says that he will now not commit suicide and goes away. The next train comes, you catch it, then you go home. The question that I want to ask you is that when you save this person from committing suicide, did you do something good? or something bad? Let's start with each and every one of you. Good or bad? Good. Good? Good. 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 100% good, okay. You did something good. You say that you did something good because you saved the person's life. A week goes and you pick up a newspaper. You see a photo of the person whose sa life you saved on the front page of the person and a report says that the person killed four people in one family. <laughs> now tell me, 
<laughs> when you saved that person's life a week ago, did you do something good or something bad? <laughs> okay, so now, now tell me, so because if you had not saved him, he may have died, but these four people would have been saved. You saved one life, but four lives went. You read this report, and you found out that he had an argument with the family, then there had been some disagreements for a long time. He couldn't do anything about it, and therefore he had a guilt complex, so he decided to kill himself. It then said that someone tried to save his life, and he decided three or four days that he did not care about his life because he was going to commit suicide anyway. He therefore decided that he would die, but he would kill that family with him. He made a plan by getting a knife and snuck into the house to kill those four people. He then went to surrender himself to the police and told them what he had done. He then he told them the whole history. It says in the newspaper that someone saved his life and you know that you are the person who saved his life. Is that a good act or a wrong act for you? One person died, four people died. Shri Krishna says that you cannot give an act a prima facie judgment. Remember the context. Arjun is in the battlefield. He doesn't want to go to war. Shri Krishna tells him to go to war. Shri Krishna tells him you cannot give an act a prima facie judgment. It is a kiddish attitude to judge whether an action is good or bad. It is a childish thing to do. We love sitting in a seat of a judge and make decisions whether someone has done something good or something bad, but who are we to decide? The whole world has a system that decides. No act can be good or bad. An act is just an act. Remember that? No act is good or bad. An act is just an act. The consequence decides whether an act was good or bad. The Gita says that an act is a chain. When we perform an act, then we're adding a link onto that chain. Then another person comes and adds a link to that chain. Then another person comes to add another link to that chain. Then the fourth person adds a link. In this way, this chain of actions keeps running. You only find out if your action was good or bad when that chain finishes. Remember that. The chain, one, two, three, four links. The chain of actions keeps running. You only find out if the good action was good or bad when the chain finishes. If you're sitting by a lake and you've thrown a stone into the lake, the ripples will start forming. At the beginning, the ripples are small, but they get bigger and bigger. In the end, it becomes so big that it touches the side of the bank and doesn't stop there. In fact, it starts again. You might be, not be able to observe this in a big lake, but you can observe it in a pond. The ripple reaches the bank and does not stop. In fact, it starts all over again in the other way. In the same way, we throw stones into the world that is like a calm lake with our actions, these ripples happen are the form, uh, that happen are the form of consequences. We have no control over this. When you throw a stone, then try to stop the ripples. If you do, these ripples will multiply in numbers. If you try to stop a ripple with your hand, then it will multiply and work their way around your hand. There is no way to stop the ripples. They just calm down with time. Remember this analogy when you throw a stone of action in this lake that's the world. When we perform an act, then it has various consequences. We cannot stop these consequences. There can be many reasons for action, including our past, the actions of our previous life, and many other reasons. These actions create the ripples. At that time, watch them with silence. If you've not done anything, yet people in society put down your name, put you down, then watch with silence. They are just ripples. If you try to stop them, they will just multiply. If you should start shouting, I've not done this, I'm not like that, then people will start talking more and more. Watch the ripples with silence. When the time comes, then the ripples will stop. Another stone will be thrown, and the ripples will start, and these ripples will join with the other ones. This is what happens in society. People just want to hold on to something. One stone is thrown, and the ripples start, then another th stone is thrown, and ripples join with that. There are so many such stone throwers in the world. When another stone is thrown, in society, then society turns their attention to that. If you try to stop your ripples, then it will not work. Therefore, do not judge the actions. And if you want to judge the actions, then judge the actions of yourself and not other people. Judging your own actions is introspection. The momentum 
in actions is intensity. If actions are done from the heart, then they will become great. Create a witness-like attitude to work. A person rises slowly through actions. Verse 18.